Here we go. Hello everybody, Paul Richards here with PTZ Optics and welcome to our second annual History of Live Streaming. We have a very special uh, whole panel of guests and Tess is going to tell us a little bit about them. Yes, we're really excited today to have some of the top names of the industry who have been through it all the whole time. So today we have Marty McPadden. Uh, Mar Marty McPadden. I almost said Marty McFadden. I always get confused. Everyone does. That's right. <laughs> Marty of Podjam.tv. We have Loria Petrucci of Live Streaming Pros. Mike Lotta, Live Streaming Director. We also have Corey Benke of LiveX NYC and Michael Dawson of EventStream. Thank you, Tess, from your little television in our black and white studio. No problem, uh, Paul. Before Anytime. we start talking about this industry that really is on fire, I wanted to briefly mention some of the guys who were on our original show, which was uh, Bruce Richardson. This is a clip from last year uh, from Video Link. Tom Sinclair from The Streaming Idiots. Andrew Haley from Wirecast. And Joe Husson from US Broadcast. I really quickly wanted to show you guys some of the things that change every single year. We were using Zoom, and you can tell because of like kind of the way it's laid out there, all of our guests. And you can even see right there where I was clicking to go full screen, mm -hmm. trying to manage that like multiple guest process. And now we're using vMix Call, um, and we're able to have full 1080p video from each person. And we can get rid of that really kind of annoying little pop-up uh, from what we had to deal with in the past. A lot can change in a year, I guess. So much is changing every single year. And let's go ahead and introduce our panel. How's everybody doing? Great. Good. Good. We're so happy to have you all here. And uh, Tess, we have some lightning round questions for yes, our guests. Yes, we had ahead? to do it. We are taking our guests into the lightning round. So this is how we're going to do it. We're going to ask you each one question. We'll start with ladies first. So Loria, <laughs> what was your first computer? Uh, I'm going to say that was when I was eight years old, a word processor. It wasn't even a real computer, though, at that time. Just a word processor. I stole my mom's. <laughs> <laughs> word processor and I don't even know what that is <laughs> <laughs> it's a little keyboard with a tiny little display that you can see it was like that little <laughs> oh, oh my that's gosh funny. that's awesome you want to take the next one Paul sure um, so let's give this one to Corey Corey what was your first live streaming software the gold standard flash media encoder the classic live media encoder I, it was that flash Yep, FME, baby. That was, the, that was the beginning of everything. You had to have that to stream. Wow. And what year was that? Uh, I don't know, but I was using it in like 2003, 2004. All right. I think it's a little earlier than that. Marty, what was the first live stream you were ever a part of? Oh, man. I, I, I think it's probably the first podcast we ever did as a business. Uh, this is probably five or six years ago. Um, we did a series of live video Twitter chat combinations um, called Podgem TV Live, and we used Google Hangouts at that time. So very, very kind of rough around the edges type of thing. But we learned a lot and progressed to today. So, yeah, my own podcast. Nice. All right. So, Mike, tell us, if you could grow up in a decade, any decade in the past, what would it be? It would be the 60s, actually, even though I'm a 70s boy, grown, uh, born in this 1970. I miss the 60s, so the 60s are quite intriguing to me. So that would definitely be where I would like to go back to. Taking it back one decade. All right, what do we have next? Let's go back to the computer question, because I kind of want to get everyone's first okay. computer. All right. All right, let's go down the line with the computer question for now. We have a few, but let's be spontaneous. Michael, what's your first computer? I had an old 286. 
I need to play Scorched Earth on it. <laughs> <laughs> is that, um, so the 286, let me briefly go to our timeline here, which is what we're going to kind of kick this off with. And um, I want to show this clip really quickly. This is the first ever television broadcast from New York City. This is from Times Square in 1936, before I think all of us were probably born. Uh, just to give it some context of kind of what we're talking about. This is what it looked like here. And, I, I, of course, that's not really live streaming. That was the very first broadcast. Um, and just to, just to kind of Man on the Moon 1969 in black and white. Um, and then this is the Amiga computer. Is that what you're talking about in 1986? I think I was a little later than that from my first one. Okay. And then Avid came out, Avid it revolutionized, um, and then 1995, this is when people started using the internet and really started, um, you know, getting on the internet, and that's when 1995, they say, was the first ever live stream, was a symphony. Uh, Akamai came out in 98, Flash Media Encoder, what Corey was telling us about in 2002, and then H.264 in 2003, which is really what makes, we still use that today. That's what is like the core of streaming. Uh, Wirecast in 2004. YouTube on two, is 2005. The first TriCaster came out in 2005. Google buys YouTube in 2006. Some YouTube stars start coming out. Netflix in 2007. I'm just running through this. Live stream in 2007. Hulu in 2008. Roku. Uh, YouTube ads live streaming in 2008, which was a pretty long time ago. Xsplit. Closer together. Vmix comes out in 2009. Decast um, 2010. Was that Casey Neistat? Casey Neistat. <laughs> PTZ Optics in 2013. H.265 in 2013. Google Hangouts in 2013. Open Broadcaster, which has been a game changer, in 2014, followed by Twitch which is a bunch of the Twitch guys. Um, and then YouTube Live. He, now we're kind of getting to where we are today, which is where I kind of want to jump into with a question for Laria. So, Laria, we were going to let you tackle this really interesting subject of social streaming. Yeah, so I, obviously, you know, social streaming is is kind of the new piece of live video, meaning... You go live from your phone and it's on a social network like Facebook or Twitter, Periscope, YouTube. And, and that connection, um, that two-way conversation is so, so, so impactful. Um, but you know, one thing that I, I didn't see there on the timeline is 2007, um, I started using social live video. Um, so it's actually not that new. However, early in the days, it was called Quick um, QIK. Does anybody remember that? Um, yeah, I remember is, Quick. We had Quick integration yeah. with live stream. Yeah. So, I, but like it first came out on the Nokia N95, it was single phone, like it wasn't open to the world, right? And that yeah. was the only, that was the first social mobile live streaming application. Obviously, we didn't have data connections like we did do today. So it wasn't a lasting experience. It wasn't a great experience. However, it was so awesome because it was the first uh, entry and foray into this into this world. So it's it's definitely come a long way in the last several years. Yeah, I think a lot of people look to you as kind of like an expert in the social um, mm -hmm. area with live streaming pros and uh, Facebook Live. Like I remember a lot of people like kind of don't like change. And I remember being so happy with my YouTube experience. I was like, what is this Facebook Live? Like, <laughs> I don't need that. And uh, uh, yes, we do. Yes, we do. And it's been so amazing. Can you just tell us about kind of like your early experiences with Facebook Live, even though it probably wasn't that long ago? Yeah, uh, well, I mean, I, I think I as soon as Facebook Live became available, it was it was very apparent that and, and we, we decided as a company, like, all right, we are taking this by storm. Like I had been already 
teaching live or teaching live video and recorded video. But at that point, it caused me to make an entire switch in my business to solely focus on social live video and how to do that from a studio and how to do it from your mobile phone. Right. So we started doing a daily live stream on Facebook live and grew very, very quickly. Um, and, and, you know, I think the more, the more you use the tools that are available to you, the more chances you have, chances you have of making a name for yourself. Obviously, it, you saw it in the timeline, right? The YouTubers, the Twitchers, those people who take advantage of this stuff early on are the ones who are able to to kind of really use it to the biggest advantage. So, Loria, branching off from, um, I know you guys have success with Geeks Life. Um, live, so Facebook Live had a big part in you guys developing live streaming pros as its own brand and, and business. Uh, yeah, and that's that's kind of like right at that first uh, section of Facebook Live and, and Periscope coming out and all of that. That's kind of when we made that switch. Um, and so it's been really super focused on live video from Facebook. I like Facebook a lot. I yeah. There are a lot of things I hate about it. Um, but there are a lot of things and I actually sent an email out this morning to my list. There's like, there's so many things to love and hate on all the platforms. Right. right. And I think that's kind of where we are right now is everybody is still figuring out kind of how to, he, how, what features to put in their own platform, um, and what to do with it. Like for instance, I love YouTube Live. I've been using YouTube Live for many, many years. Um, they they took a while to come out with the mobile version of that, uh, but they also have like silly little things about YouTube Live that drive me insane. Like the fact that once this live stream is over, all your comments on YouTube are gone, yep. and we don't get to keep them around. Well, right? We fix, like we fixed that, Laria. Well, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> that was one of my biggest freaking issues with YouTube Live. So I actually hired a developer to download all the fr use the API to download the chats and so store them in a database because I can't stand that. It's so annoying. Yeah, it is annoying. And I, that, I think, you know, every single platform has definitely got its pros and cons and uh, to that that stuff is moving at a really super fast pace. If we look at the years that YouTube came up in just terms of recorded video, like all of the changes are happening so much faster now because as consumers, we're demanding a whole lot more, a whole lot faster. Um, last thing we have, so you actually basically covered everything except we were going to maybe, do you want to touch on Twitter and Periscope and maybe some of the other social media networks? I mean, it seems like, can we look at them maybe as Twitter versus YouTube versus Facebook? It seems like Facebook and YouTube are really the dominant players. Are there other social media platforms people should think about? Well, it depends on what you're trying to do with live video, right? Like, I mean, all of us here, for example, on this panel, we take slight different, slightly different approaches to our live video as, you know, as a business, as a hobby, all, all of it, right? So it depends on what you're trying to accomplish. If it's a business for you, or if you're trying to like build a business using your live streaming, then Facebook wins out. Um, if you're trying to have, if you're trying, if you're a musician, you should go to Busker probably, right? Like, I mean, <laughs> because Busker is, is another social live platform that allows mm. you to uh, bring in, to get donations during your live stream. And it's specifically targeted to like musicians and performers. Um, so there are these many micro networks that are specifically targeted at different people for different purposes. Um, and so that's been an interesting thing. I don't put a whole lot of, mm, shall we say, um, effort into or confidence really into new social networks that don't have a big name like Facebook or Twitter, right? Because they come and they go very, very quickly. Uh, and so that's one thing that you've got to pay attention to is, is the, is it worth the effort of, mm -hmm. you know, putting my time into this platform when you're trying to choose one? Cause sometimes they do go away just because of lack of users or lack of funds for sure. Um, and 
you know, one thing, if you're speaking of what you're trying to accomplish, if you're trying to do like the highest quality live streaming possible online and you're trying to build an audience and that YouTube is great for because 4K streaming on YouTube looks amazing. Um, YouTube puts so much effort into the quality factor um, where they lack in other areas. You know, Facebook is the exact opposite. Uh, Twitter, I'm super impressed with Twitter or with Periscope's encoding. Um, we send them a what should be a crap signal and we get an amazing looking video. So I'm like, whatever they're doing, they've they've got it going, <laughs> going on. <laughs> Does anybody have any comments about social streaming from our panel? Because um, our next topic is the epic scale of live streaming. I was gonna let Corey, um, who's really the architect behind the world's largest, most watched live stream in the world. I'm looking forward to hearing and about I that. I cannot wait to talk about that, but is there anything on the social network? Because I know Marty, I know you were a big blab.im guy and then it died on you, right? Yeah, well, I mean, I uh, the what, what's great about those kind of uh, platforms is discoverability and meeting people. I, I, I'll, I'll say this, I met uh, one of my good friends now, Stephen Haywood on that platform. Uh, I've been following Stephen for a long time saw them broadcasting on, they reached out and we struck up and we're, now we're quite good friends. So I think Blab for that has been great. I've met a lot of people that I would not have met um, through that platform. Now it didn't have enough money and it suffered from quality issues. And that kind of points to even what Laurie is saying is that I think what's gonna win out in the end is quality. You guys watch, um, you know, I primarily as a business, I do live streaming as a business. I'm not on camera a lot anymore. I am behind the controls, and one of the things we've noticed is the demand for quality from clients, and they want to kind of up the ante as far as making it more TV-like, as far as the productions we do. And it's great to see platforms like Facebook. YouTube's always been there, but Facebook and kind of up in the and you can see where this thing is going and who they're trying to attract. They're trying to attract high-quality content, and everyone's kind of in that horse race trying to get people to come in. You even see it with YouTube, even even beyond live streaming i mean what's happened on youtube over the years all the vloggers they up the quality that's really where it's at so i mean i think it's exciting you know better the, the best days are still ahead of us but but i like where it's going and the other thing as i think laurie mentioned it, the pace of change is so unbelievable i'll give you an example i'll give you a confession i used i had a tricaster mini for for a while i recently sold it and the reason is, is that for the money I put into it right now, I can kind of build my own boxes just for the stuff I'm doing. doesn't mean that it's, it's a bad piece of equipment, but if I'm going into TriCaster, I'm going to go up to the higher levels. I think that's where the value is. But again, because it's changing so fast, I got to change with it. And it's just, I'm knee deep in it every day, trying to keep up with it, you know, and, and trying to serve my clients the best way I can. I fully Very agree with that, Marty. I think it's really vital that as as we enter this this world and and as things change, that you do focus on quality. That's one of my biggest messages in in, in what I do. But I, I won't. I think it's those people who are who are going to focus on the quality are going to be the ones who win because people like YouTube, people like Facebook, are constantly looking for people to to partner with in various ways um and that's if you can be one of those people man dude you're made right i mean that is key um and so i, I love i love what you said there marty yeah absolutely but it's really cool i just sorry just one other thing yeah. i just i just <laughs> want to take a moment since we're talking about the history of live streaming to say this is an incredible time that we live in. I mean, you guys on this panel have been in the industry for even some of you longer than I have. I mean, to look at where it used to be and what we can do today, it's an incredible movement in, in terms of what our opportunities are, I think. We're getting some great uh, questions in the chat. We're going to have a post show where it's all Q&A and test me, write them down or copy and paste them or do something. It's great questions, but we got to move over to Corey here. Corey, I want to talk to you about like the epic scale of what's possible today because you really, uh, I mean, with what you did for the New York City Times Square um, New Year's, that must be insane. It's incredible. I mean, I showed a couple clips of it. Um, can you tell us about that? 
Yeah, so we started the webcast. I've been on the show for 17 years, and we actually started the webcast in 2008, and we used Livestream exclusively. It was before I actually joined Livestream as head of production for a couple of years. And surprisingly, I don't think anybody would be surprised, but you know, right as the ball would drop, the stream would go out every time yeah. for about six years that happened, right? So, because everybody's trying to see the ball drop online. Oh. Um, and about three years ago, live stream started to reach scale and we started to have like a much better experience. But the funny thing is about live stream, kind of to, to tie on the social thing, right? People complain about the quality of Facebook, but Facebook has m better scale than anyone, including YouTube right now. Um, and a lot of that is because they force people at 720p, you know, they just recently upgraded to the 3.5 megabit or the 4 megabit. But, you know, that's where the quality is going to come in is as they figure out ways to scale their codec uh, over time. But um, New Year's is a fascinating use case. It's, it's the biggest in North America. The World Cup is bigger. There's a lot of broadcasters that actually get more, more people. But it's an interesting use case in the sense of, you know, MPEG-2 broadcast doesn't, it doesn't matter. The scalability of it's already built into the system. But uh, with streaming, that's not the case, right? You need, a, you need an edge server for every 1,000 to 3,000 users. And you have to find a way to scale that very quickly. And to turn on servers, even for Akamai, even if it happens in seconds, um, it doesn't, you know, if everybody comes, if, if, if 1 million people are watching the ball drop at 11.30, and then three million people show up five minutes before. How do you scale up servers in time to know that you're going to get that? And even if you, you know, and if you scale up servers too early, that could be millions of dollars that you just waste, right? Wow. So it's it's actually really fascinating the the under the underlying structure of streaming. So so in 2006, I actually built a, a small CDN for Clear.com. And we were at South by Southwest, and I was streaming on the back of a truck with Flash Media Encoder over. It was it was Clear's first 4G network was in Austin at the time, and I was literally. It sounds like you could just do this all the time now, but I had a 4G stick, and I was just streaming off the back of a truck, literally having artists come into a truck. And even then, you could see the scalability issues with streaming. So it's kudos to Facebook um, because they figured out. I mean. It's crazy. Like every time Facebook messes up, I go, I go, wow, you know, there's only a billion streams happening right now. Like it's, it's kind of epic, you know, from a live streaming standpoint where they've gone and, you know, they released the API for, for, for producers last April. Right. And we were the, we were, we actually were the first company to actually stream on their API when they first released the API and they, they had their conference for Cheddar and for Daily Burn the next morning. And it's fascinating to see in such a short period of time, and in less than you know, 13 months, where they've come, they've already increased the bandwidth on a 720p stream. So you got to imagine by the end of the year, they're going to be at 1080p 60, and probably at 4K by this time next year. I, I would I would surmise. Although I'm always the one saying they're going to release more products than they release at NAB, and then they always underwhelm me. So don't don't take my word for it. <laughs> so. That's such so much. Uh, you, know, you have so much experience. Um, quick questions okay, coming from the social side to um, the epic scale of what you're doing with some of these live streams. Does social streaming, like what Facebook and YouTube is offering you, is that like saving the day for you because you can leverage their servers, or <laughs> could you possibly crash Facebook and YouTube with your twenty-four, like with your uh, Times Square ball drop? You can crash it. The, the reality is, is that. If you don't have a multi-distribution play right now, you're failing. And, and here's a number I'll share with you. So uh, for New Year's Eve two years ago, we had over three, we had 3.4 million viewers, right? And those were all based on embeds on live stream. So we had over 250 people, including the New York Times, People.com, taking the embed of the official and putting it on their website, right? And that's how we generated those views. Last year, we generated 3.4.1 uh, million. However, only 1.5 of them were from the embeds. The other uh, streams were from Facebook and Twitter. So what's happening is, is as the platforms grow and become monopolistic, no one will leave to go to your site to watch your show, right? 
So you have to be on those networks because that's where your audience is and that's where you have to get them. So it's two things, Paul. It's like, yes, that helps you scale because you can always say, hey, Facebook's working and this isn't working, right? Because you have a multi-distribution strategy. But more importantly, the embed strategy is, is, is really dying on the vine. It's very important for your brand, right? I, I, I can see a million times we, we did, uh, uh, thousands of times we would do like hundred thousand over a hundred thousand dollar streaming productions for major brand clients four or five years ago and they would just have an embed on their page right those views would be like four or five thousand and the, i would i would actually be ashamed i'd look at the client and i would be like wow you just spent a quarter million dollars on this amazing production that four thousand people watched you know then we do this kevin hart stream last my last uh, summer in miami and it generates two hundred and sixty five thousand and we did it with two FS5s on a, on a you know, using vMix. And, and it was kind of like, wow, like this is crazy. Like the, the power of social, uh, it, it can't actually be underestimated right now. Yeah, that's so important. And I, I feel like no matter what we talk about today, it's going to come back to social because it's like just the game changer. And what's funny is we weren't even talking about Facebook Live last year. It wasn't even out. I mean... It's like, it's just the oh, amount of change that's point. going on is incredible. Um, there's a lot of questions, but we're going to just keep rolling here. Uh, Marty, I wanted to ask you about influencers and how mm -hmm. they are moving in the industry. How are br big brands using this in marketing? Yeah, it, it's funny because that's, that's part of our business. We work with primarily with agencies and then their clients are the bigger brands. So I'll, I'll, I'll give you two examples. Uh, it, I will say this, it, it's kind of been a slow ride and mainly to convince the brands that live is something that they you know, would want to do and not be too afraid of losing control of their message. I think that's really the big, and that continues to be the biggest hurdle, at least for me working with agencies and their agencies working with brands. But I'll give you two examples that we've been involved with recently. Uh, one, that we produced, uh, we work with an agency whose client is Verizon Wireless, and we've done a series of Twitter chat slash live video chats with their community. Uh, and we've not only done it, uh, I, and I remotely produced these, not only from the, uh, I'll bring in people from their homes and we'll have a discussion, but we'll also go on, on the road and produce live videos from the Verizon destination stores or big you know, destination type stores, you know, showcase stores. And we've had people on there and we produce great numbers. And really the, the biggest thing I've noticed and that, and we did that with an embed and, and, and just what, what was being said here is that I think for me, the biggest, one of the biggest seismic events was when Facebook launched the API. And what I noticed, and I'll give you an example of that when I did my, sh when I would do my regular show uh, uh, with, with Mark, um, we would do the embed on a landing page, but as soon as Facebook launched, we also, you know, broadcast to Facebook at the same time simultaneously. And it was funny because the reaction was, I got a bunch of new people watching the show that didn't even know I did a show because of my audience on Facebook is a totally different audience than what I would get from YouTube or my own embed. And I, I think that is everything right now. I've noticed it even in our business where we're, we're streaming directly to pages brand pages and just not only do they have a large audience there that's already built in but you also have the drive-by especially on Facebook you know with the with the logarithm it's gonna show up in people's news feeds they're gonna see oh what's this and they're gonna click on it and the discoverability there is ph phenomenal and I agree I think the embed that that's a challenge I mean everybody wants to have people come back to their own site but that's a challenge they're gonna stay where they're they pick you up first and that's it um, the other example yeah. I will give you, yeah. yeah, exactly. The other example I'll give you, I, I, I don't do a lot of influencer stuff myself, but what I was recently invited by Huawei to travel to Shenzhen, China to meet with their folks, take a tour of the factory. Me and my wife went out there. And being China, I didn't take any fancy gear with me. I had my iPhone, basically. And I produced video clips from the iPhone, iPhone 7, uh, for, you know, up to 4K video. And I put together this nice little interview with the VP of communications there, put it out on that. We have a Facebook group, put it out on there to share. And it's done really well. And they were really impressed with it. And 
I didn't even tell him that, you know, I mean, do you realize this was from a phone? And I think that's another game changer here where the quality of the equipment being, you know, in your phone, iPhone 7, um, is a real, and, and the quality of the video that you can get out of that. Now, it's not going to replace, a, a, you know, a high-end Sony camera, you know, you know, six, you know, $100,000 camera. Still not yet, but I mean, but that's a real game changer for folks, you know, and, and even YouTube opening up direct streaming from um, the app opens up a lot of areas. But, but again, I'll, I'll go back to my original thing I said before was it comes back to quality. And, and I've noticed that with clients is that they're demanding more and more quality. They're seeing what's out there, more TV like type of stuff intermingled with the Instagram stories, Snapchat, all the direct to video, the raw stuff, you know. So um, it's very, very interesting that in that case. So I'm really interested was, to see what China does. Sorry, go ahead, Corey, with live. No, show. I was going to say one thing about the phone to, to Marty's point. We just produced MojoCon for Teradek using their live air product with three iPhone 6s. And no one go. knew that we were using iPhones. And I there just bought the Sling Studio, which I haven't had a chance to check out, but we just bought it here. Um, I didn't want to buy it, but a friend of mine was doing this vice stream and he was using it for a cooking channel and it looked amazing. And I was like, I got to get this thing. I got to try it out. And apparently there's Teradex Live Air product and there's Sling Studio. And those are literally products that are just like take your phone and bring with it into uh, professional production. So, Wow. Well, that actually brings us into what we wanted to talk to Michael Dawson about, um, the president of Event Stream Canada. And we, uh, he was actually on the show a couple of weeks ago. One of the main questions that came out of it is, can you, and this is kind of a question for everybody, but I want Michael to go ahead and jump into this first. Can you make people feel like they're actually at an event? Can you, can you take someone to Times Square, Manhattan, and on an iPad at home, can the viewers feel like they're there? Are we, are we th there? Does that have to be 4K? Does it have to be VR 360? Is, is it possible with the is, – is there, is there a way? <laughs> is my question to you, Michael. And, and I think technology plays a role in that, but ultimately I don't think technology is the most important piece. I think when it comes to um, engagement, which is really what we're talking about, it's, it's up to the producer. It's the producer of the show. Um, in respect to like, how are you engaging the audience in your stream? Because your stream could look great, but if it's completely a, a lean back view, then it's just like you're sort of watching TV, but you're watching it on your computer. I think the power of live streaming, the thing that actually makes it really interesting. Um, and, you know, we can sort of see that on the show today with all the people typing in and you've got your, your YouTube comments API coming up. Uh, the, the, the thing is, you know, are we really engaging the people who are watching? And if you can do that as a producer, and that may be through, you know, multi angles, that may be through, you know, a Q&A with the people who are actually uh, presenting from your event. If you can do that, in, in a, a really engaging way, that's what's going to pull people into your event. That's what's going to make them feel like they're actually there. Because you know, we can all agree that the experience of being at an event is, is a lot different from watching it on on you know on a, on a screen, right? You don't have that emotional connection. But if you can have, if you can feel like you're engaged and you can feel like they're aware of you there, like we always talk to our clients, we say, hey, whenever you're doing a, you know, whenever we're live streaming with you, make sure you engage the live audience, say hi to them, thank them for joining you, you know, make sure make sure they feel like they're in the room as well and that their questions are valid and their comments are valid and that you want to hear them. Those are the type of things that are going to pull them into the stream, and I think that's really where the key focus needs. To to be for computer for producers when you're thinking about producing a stream very i wholeheartedly agree with that i mean you can have 360 video with no host and nobody actually talk like he, like michael just said engaging with the audience versus a crappy iphone or crappy you know uh, phone mobile stream with an excited host going oh my gosh can you imagine what just happened take a look at this this is amazing and it kind of describes it and shows it to you that is more key to bringing people along into that world and making them feel a part of the experience showing them all the behind the scenes stuff, talking to them, getting them to, to tell you what they want to see and you go over there and you find it, right? Like I 100% agree, that's the way you, you get it versus a boring 360 video. I agree. And I think if you're not doing that, you're really missing the point of life. 
I mean, we're yeah, not, absolutely. we're not, you know, if we're talking about sports, it's kind of a different thing. If you're talking about breaking news, of course, that's a different thing. But anything else, any other content, no matter what, if you're not engaging the audience in a live capacity, um, then you're, you're doing it wrong. So I think that's why it drives me between, insane. between what Laurie is saying and what Michael's saying, because I think, Laurie, what, what you're telling us, and I totally agree with both of you, is that, like, bring them in, like, physically bring that camera in behind the scenes and do it. And then also, I think what Michael was kind of referring to is, like, audience engagement, maybe, like, APIs, bringing in chats. How can we, like, bring, like, technology, like, the APIs, the, the chats, like we're showing here, but then also what Laurie is saying, like, really master the art of bringing people into the camera, into the experience. I guess it's yeah. kind of like a mix yeah, of content. both. Yeah. I think it's definitely I mean, a mix. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> for sure. Go ahead. <laughs> No, I was just gonna. I was gonna agree. You know, it is a mix, and it, while you're, it depends on how you're doing your stream, whether you can use technology to do so or not. Um, you know, if you have a big, bigger setup, then you can bring in um, services that will allow you to show their faces on screen or their comments on screen. If you're just using your phone, then you've got to rely on the the actual talking and engagement factor right so it depends on what you're doing um and honestly you know quality is absolutely key here but there are a lot of things that you can do as a host or as um a producer to really overcome that when you don't have it does that make absolutely. sense absolutely a lot of people in the chat when you guys were talking about the importance of quality um, were saying, well, content is also extremely important because if you have nothing interesting or a value for your audience to say, then you know, you're know you probably not gonna have as good a success as you would if you did have good content. Absolutely. And that's literally the, the history of YouTube. I mean, YouTube started out with, with the quality was terrible. It was amateur produced videos, but they were getting billions of views because people like the authenticity of it. Uh, it wasn't about the quality. It was about the, the, the content and it was about that, that connection with the audience. And I think that's really, um, you know, that's where we're going to go. And I got to tell you one thing I'm excited about, and I, I think you probably are too, is um, Apple just decided that in Safari, in the next Safari and in the next iOS, that they're going to be supporting WebRTC. And that's the protocol that we are using here in order to have this conversation. And that essentially means that using something like BMix Call, you can now bring somebody in from their iPhone into your broadcast. I mean, this type of thing you're going to see is going to be the next, I think, the next game changer. Um, and I'd love to hear everyone else's thoughts on that. But for me, I can't tell you how excited we are about that. Yeah, I agree. I mean, I think one of the challenges is uh, being a producer behind the camera working. And primarily, I work with a lot of non quote, non-professionals uh, that aren't on camera professionals and need a lot of coaching. And that's really a, a big uh, hurdle is really kind of coaching them through it and getting them to understand that, you know, looking in the camera, being excited, being natural, you know, not being too nervous and going with the flow and inter and also not forgetting to interact with the comments and the people watching. And frankly, that takes a lot of practice. And I think when people get into this for the first time, they realize, man, those professionals make it look really easy. And I think that's where people really get tripped up in this is they think that, oh, this is easy. I can just do this. And they try it once and they discover it's not so easy. And then they, I think a lot of people give up too quickly instead of looking at this as a long-term perspective. And it just takes a lot of practice. Um, me personally, I used to do a show with an on-camera professional. I'm not on camera professional. I think I've come a long way, but this is not my main thing. My main thing is behind the controls. But the more you do it, knowing to look in the camera, knowing your mic position, smiling, the expression, leaving your pacing when you're talking, getting rid of the ums and ahs, all that stuff just takes practice. And that's for me is the toughest thing. And again, because of the pace of changes so quickly, I think people really have to look at this as a long, if you really want to get good. And I, I think Michael, you said it, you know, YouTube, when they first started out, it was it was really crappy quality and even the on camera presence wasn't there. But you look at some of the more successful vloggers today, they are pro and they make it look very easy. You know, I think that's that's the big thing. I can I talk 
to our students about layering complexity um, in that sense, because you're absolutely right. Like that's it's difficult to think about everything that you could do. So if you just layer complexity and you add one thing, get good at that, then add another thing, get good at that. Whether we're talking about on camera or produ production stuff or all of it together, like people try and jump way too hot high before they learn the the basics yep. so i think that's that's key to success over that time that you're talking about i cannot wait for our ama kind of a q a because i think that there's just already so many good questions and uh there's so much interesting stuff uh, mike i want to i wanted to get with mike lotta here i think you've been in the industry longer than ever anyone but i don't know for that for a fact can you just tell us a little bit about you know where you've come from and like what you're most excited about coming from i know more of like a a television studio kind of like movie hollywood studio background sure sure yeah basically my background actually is a lot more based on computers as a matter of fact because back in the day, I actually started uh, with the streaming media stuff back in 95. So that shows you how many years that the streaming technology has no taken to actually to <laughs> – what was that? Real player. 95, real player, that's exactly. real player, right? Man. Exactly. Wow. Yeah, and actually, I can actually – there's Ouch. one more before that, actually, that uh, actually real player actually bought out was a company called VideoNet. And they actually had the very first live streaming server and first phone client. So you could actually make phone calls from your Windows 95 based machine and you could also watch live events with your video live player back in 95. So yeah, so basically they got bought out, put together with Progressive Networks, AKA Real Networks, and then from there, there was, um, of course, Microsoft got into the game with Microsoft Windows Media. And then, of course, the next one, believe it or not, is Apple that came into play. Apple QuickTime, they decided that, oh, this streaming stuff is pretty cool, so let's add that technology to our QuickTime player. That was a horrible idea, but... <laughs> Needless yeah. to say, it worked. <laughs> as everybody, if everybody was using it back in the day, so basically it was the big three for the for a while until about two thousand and two. Again, when when uh, they decided that there's why is there three? Because basically back then, you had to have the capture card capability, and that's why I love the Osprey capture cards, Paul. When I was mentioning that to you, when you guys had mm -hmm. the Osprey guy on was because he actually came up with a technology where you could actually send the same video and audio feed to multiple encoders. And back then, very much like you guys have nowadays where you guys are sending to YouTube and Facebook and Periscope, back then we were doing, you had to send it to this technology and that technology and this technology to cover all the people to make sure that they all had the players for <laughs> to watch the actual event. So back then you had to send it to a real player a Windows Media player, and then a QuickTime if, for the Mac guys because the Mac guys didn't have Windows Media, and if they did, it was a it was a really terrible version of <laughs> Windows Media working. But and uh, the viewer had it, to pick their bit right too, Mike. Exactly, yeah, yeah. that's it, Mike. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you, you had a list of five bit rates, and you had to pick the one that suited your connection. That's right. See, I'm really sure. Mike, do you... no, that's exactly it. Do you miss those days, Mike, or are you like not. glad that they're over? Okay. Yeah, totally. <laughs> that that Cla Mike, cloud that transcoding Mike, is the greatest thing ever. Mike, yeah, yeah. <laughs> he loves that. He loves the new technology. Me, I'm an old school dude. I'm, I've been more in the server end, so I'm not again very much like uh, Marty. I'm not usually in front of the camera. I'm usually behind the camera doing doing the productions and stuff like that. So I'm and again, I'm usually working with amateurs as well so um, a lot of it has been what I've seen the most that is taken taken part for streaming is the more and more people have more and more home bandwidth the better off that things have become because back in those days you got to remember back in the early 95 you were lucky to have 
you know, 120, well, actually, you were having 56 a 56 KBS, KBS, baby. 56. Yeah, you that's got. it. <laughs> so, you know, <laughs> nowadays, you know, and if anybody gets 56K nowadays, you know, it's like, you know, but it, basically the, you're talking dial-up is what that is was classified back in those days. That wasn't even DSL technology. That wasn't even cable technology that we even have nowadays, where you're getting the one megabits, two megabits, ten megabits, fifteen megabits. And now, of course, if you get fiber to the home, well, you're just going right through the roof now. So that's what I've seen over the course of all the 20 years that I've been doing the streaming, is going from you know itty bitty little postage stamps that everybody makes fun of, you know, postage stamp video that we had to make look as cute as possible that you would full screen <laughs> and it still look like crap but anyway mm. um but yeah so you went from so i'll be techie here for a second 160 by 120 and now you guys have gone up to 920 1920 by 1080 <laughs> and you know and 4k and etc 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 down down the road but again bandwidth has been the huge thing it, mm -hmm. and again if you don't have the bandwidth as you guys are probably known if you're watching like a netflix or even a high k you know 4k youtube video or anything like that you really need good bandwidth coming home and that was that was the big that was the big thing once see back in the early 90s we were only doing audio you know my very first live event getting back to the live event questions my very first live event was doing an audio event from a concert Wow. That was it, and we were broadcasting at 28k. Woo! Right and roll. <laughs> wow, that must have sounded great. <laughs> well, yeah. Well, again, you know. Well, again, with real with real player that officially was 20. So again, I had to make sure that you know not only the 56k people were able to listen, but the 28a modem people also had were able to listen as well. So. Yeah. Well, that was one of our that was one of our huge things at live stream. I had to tell clients all the time before we had adaptive bit rate was, yeah, I can send the stream at 720p, I have the bandwidth. I can send the stream at 1080, I have the bandwidth. But your viewers do not have the bandwidth. And as soon as I do that at a single bit rate, I just ruin the experience. You're gonna get more complaints than anybody. And adaptive bit rate and the platforms kind of have changed that paradigm. You know, you now have transcoding across pretty much all the platforms. But that's only a two year development, really. You you know the days of really having to send the multiple bit rates are a little bit over now. Exactly, and so I'm come I come from the days of, you know, when we had to send out, you know, not only it was talking about you know real Windows and and QuickTime at the time, we had two bit rates here, two bit rates here, two bit rates here, you know, so the, it was like, so we had to make sure that we had basically back in the day we were doing high and low. If you had low mm -hmm. bandwidth, you chose low. If you had high bandwidth, you chose high. And pray to God that high actually was, you did actually have high. <laughs> if not, you were going to low I mean, very quickly. Still today, we still have to think about bit rates, but not, not quite like that for sure. But if you're going to tweak your streams at all, going out to even the social platforms, you still have to know a little bit, but it's, gosh, that sounds wretched. <laughs> <laughs> I know I sound like Dave, right, Lucia? I'm talking about all this stuff. Luria. Uh, Luria, sorry. Yeah. No, so okay. when I was, yeah, but again, a lot of this stuff has been, you know, again, I've been in the CDN world. I've done a lot of different stuff there as well, building actual content delivery networks. So I understand what you guys are talking about there. And, you know, a lot of this has become. A lot easier for you, Paul, especially when nowadays, you know, with the different vid blasters and the vmixes and the wirecasts of the world, as you were mentioning uh, to me, uh, those basically are just software video switchers. So, mm -hmm. you know, a lot of this stuff used to be independent. Back in the day, you used to have a hardware switcher, then you used to have your, you know, character generator that actually put the graphics on top, then you actually had your encoder. That actually was a computer, because heaven forbid you can actually buy it in, you know, one of these units that actually it wasn't a coder. That that's all it did. So you actually had to build a computer that had an actual capture card in it. Nine times out of ten, Osprey capture card, because there wasn't Black Magic or anything else back then. And 
usually at that particular point you brought in a single video feed and then you would send out a single video feed. Wow. Or depending on if it was again the real QuickTime and and Windows Media scenario again, you were sending out three feeds. Because you you know a lot of the days and even now with capture cards uh, Osprey definitely came out with this uh, technology called Simulstream. And basically what the Simulstream allowed you to do was take the one video and audio feed coming into the capture card and allow you to break it out to as many pieces of software on the computer as you wanted to. And that's where you broke it out to the different Windows Media Encoder. You know, you can do Flash Media Encoder. You can do a re real media encoder. You can do QuickTime. Had its Darwin you know, uh, based software that they were using as well. So that, yeah, so as far as the vid blasters, the vmixes, the wirecast, the tricasters of the world, they're basically have combined, you know, it's the infamous four pieces of hardware that four people, you know, as Tom St. Clair would say, you know, you one man, one computer. Well, it's, it's true because now, back in those days, it was, you know, one person did the video switching. And even in broadcast nowadays, if you looked at you know some of these broadcast trucks, sometimes when they take you, quote unquote, behind the scenes, that's what they're still doing. There's this process well, is would, still going on. Well, I would make an I would make an argument that the days of the hardware switcher are not numbered. And I'm somebody who actually helped develop the live stream studio product uh, in its early infancy, and I love it. And I think there's always room for a computer switcher. But uh, to your point, like for instance, we just did the U.S. Open. And we actually used a Ross Carbonite Black Solo. We used Touch Designer sending a key. We took the key and the switcher, and, and we had two vmixes. One vmix was pulling RTMPs from the golf course, and one vmix was just like an EBS playback machine. Now, computers break, right? And so typically, when I go higher end, I always want a switcher, a hardware switcher, right in line, because that the, 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 the likelihood of that hardware switcher dying is very low the likelihood of a computer going down is very high. And so, mm. to your point, Mike, like, uh, I think there's still, there's still a very good use case. We, we, you know, I would say half of our business is vMix, and tri we don't use TriCaster, but vMix and Livestream Studio for, you know, your smaller streams where we need to have one person running the whole thing. And then, you know, we build up from there where it's either a Blackmagic switcher or a, a raw switcher. Um, I still think there's there's definitely for your higher end productions and your your bigger budget productions there's definitely uh, a good reason to use the breakout. I would exactly. actually agree with that, and, Corey. We're the same. We're yeah. the same. We do the same thing. Yeah, exactly. And, yeah, and I agree with that too. But definitely, yeah. Paul was mentioning to me. You know, we usually chat about the different uh, vmixes, vid blaster going re way back, and then Wirecast, of course, being one of the first where Wirecast actually was only made for Mac way back in the day, guys. Yeah. So, yeah. And it was and only I, for quick-time streaming back in those days, too. I see so many people using the, the software-based and only software-based, right? And And I can't tell you how many in my business, how many people on a daily basis I funnel through experiencing technical issues that they don't understand because they're only using software on a laptop that they're using for everything mm. else, right? And it just yeah, doesn't work. You got to, browser, right? Exactly, exactly. <laughs> they, so they, they didn't shut so down, true. you know. And so it's, um, I, there's, there's this knowledge that, you know, industry people have of why the hardware stuff works so well and why it's there versus this new world of social where we've got browser-based platforms mm -hmm. that yeah. cause all sorts of problems um, and then software stuff that you know is great but you have to know what you're doing right so there's this whole education process that still has to happen if you want to do a social live stream and still have very good success with it not crashing in the middle of no, no AV sync issues that kind of stuff so guys, well, I, I want to I, jump I into the uh, end of the Q&A because we've got so many questions and people have been waiting so long. So let me roll the credits <laughs> and we got to answer some of these questions for our audience. Thank you guys so much for joining <laughs> us today.